Thank you very much. Good morning, Sydney. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here at the Art Gallery of New South Wales. And I have to be honest with you, I've spent the last 40 years working in artificial intelligence, and this is by far the most exciting time to be working in the field because we're making real progress, and the technologies that we've been working on trying to make computers a little bit smarter are starting to leave the laboratory and turn up in our lives. And um, the challenge with that, of course, is that we want to make sure that they turn up in our lives in a responsible way. And so this talk um, actually has a book associated with it, Machines Behaving Badly, and I believe some of you are going to be lucky enough to get a signed copy of that book. Um, but if not, I encourage you to, to perhaps um, download the book. It's available um, from Amazon, the Kindle store, all leading bookstores because I can't do justice to this topic in the next half an hour, and then there'll be time for some, some of your questions. Um, this is a, a book full of stories about how things can go wrong and the elephant traps that we have to worry about. The book started, as, as indeed the, the talk started, um, pretty much back in 2018 when I had a real moment of revelation uh, I get calls from the media most days to talk about the latest development in artificial intelligence. You, you can't open a newspaper today without reading multiple stories about how AI is doing something new, and in many cases, people's concerns about the fact that AI is doing something new. Anyway, I was getting calls from the media about Google's I.O. conference. So every year, Google have a big conference in, in uh, Silicon Valley to announce their, their latest uh, ad advancements, latest software, latest hardware. And there was, uh, at the Google AI conference back in 2018, the main demo, the most exciting demo, the one that really rocked the crowd was of Duplex. Um, now, unfortunately, um, I don't have uh, uh, a demo of it here for you today, but if you go to YouTube and type in duplex Google, you can uh, watch the, the demo that was given. And indeed, in the United States, they're actually already rolling it out as one of the services that Google provides. Now, duplex is their latest super duper uh, voice assistant. It's like Siri on steroids. If you haven't heard it, I encourage you to go and listen to the demo. And you can get Duplex to do useful things for yourself. It will um, book a haircut or book a restaurant table for you. Say, so book me a table for five at eight o'clock at my favorite Italian restaurant. And it will ring up the restaurant and it will have a conversation with the person. Um, and it's not totally scripted. It, you know, the conversation go off in different directions depending upon what the, the person at the restaurant says. Um, and I think what really got people was that it was actually impossible to tell that this wasn't a human. And indeed, it was deliberately designed to be deceptive. It ummed and ahed like a human. And there's no reason a computer should um and ah other than to fool you that it was a, computer, it, it was a human, not a computer. Uh, what's more disturbing about this story that the media are ringing me up to, to talk about um, was that I know quite a few people who work at Google, quite, and people on the ethics team even, and they had told senior management, very senior management, um, that you shouldn't do this demo without putting a warning in front. Before you ring people up with the computer, you should, you should tell them, you know, I'm Toby's computer. I'm ringing you up to book a, uh, a restaurant table for Toby. Not pretend to be uh, a human. That's bad behavior. And indeed, you know, a lot of the things that I get asked to talk about are often tech companies behaving badly. Um, you know, if, if a tech company employed people to knock on your door and pretend to be someone that they're not, you'd say, well, that's rather bad behavior. Um, so the fact that a, a tech company was using a computer to metaphorically knock on your door, pretend to be someone they're not, that's also bad behavior. Um, and of course, there's plentiful stories in Hollywood about you know, computers being mistaken for humans and how that can all go rather badly. 
So not understandably, um, the media were somewhat concerned by this demo, where, where it was going to take us. And, and then I started to get other calls from the media about another breaking story. Uh, this was about the upcoming royal wedding, um, the um, Harry uh, marrying Meghan. Um, and Sky News were going to be using facial recognition software to identify the guests arriving uh, at that wedding without any consent from anyone about uh, whether they should be using this facial recognition software um, and ex you know, name, the, name the celebrities that were supposedly turning up. Um, and again, the media were somewhat concerned about you know, where is all this going to take us? And of course, we know where this is going to take us. This is going to take us to having facial recognition software in Bunnings. Um, uh, and at that point, you know, it, it dawned on me, two things dawned on me. First of all, it's a full-time job just answering the media's concerns about uh, where, where this is all going to take us. And that's why I wrote the book, and that's why I, I've been giving um, a bunch of talks like this one, talking about some of the risks, some of the challenges that we face. And the second is that actually a lot of this isn't, doesn't require us to think about new things. We've been thinking about the responsible uses of technology for hundreds of years. I mean, ever since we started industrializing our lives, we've been introducing technology, worrying about how technology introduced, is introduced into our lives. And there's nothing magical about artificial intelligence. Uh, it, it really is just another technology. And so the quite sorts of questions we should ask about artificial intelligence are the sorts of questions we should ask about any technology. Um, the, the fundamental challenge, though, with artificial intelligence is that it's an entirely dual-use technology. There are good things that we can do with the technology, and there are bad things that we can use with the technology, and it's exactly the same technology that gets used for good or bad. So let me go back to the facial recognition software. An example of artificial intelligence, we can recognize people's faces. Um, and there are fantastically good uses of, our, of facial recognition software. Um, I'll give you two examples. Um, a couple of years ago in Delhi, in, in India, um, they took facial recognition software into a lot of orphanages and they were able to reunite nearly 3,000 children who had been separated from their families. Um, you know, it's a bit like the movie Lion in a big country, crowded country like India, it's easy to get separated from your parents and if you're too young to remember where you live and what your parents are called, um, then you become an orphan. And so they were able to use this software for an immense good. Uh, as a second example, there are a number of organizations um, using facial recognition software to scan faces on the internet to stop child sex trafficking. An immense evil um, and something that you, know, you can't do this by eye. You can't do this by hand. Um, there are too many faces on the internet to scan them all by, um, by, by, um, by eye. But you can get a computer. An algorithm can do that. Um, so an immense good. Uh, but equally, same software, same facial recognition software is being used to, to commit uh, immense harm. We only have to look towards China and to see the persecution of the Uyghurs and the fact that the China is being turned into a surveillance state using that facial recognition software um, to commit um, immense human rights uh, harms. Um, and uh, if you want to know uh, exactly the capability, that, I mean, what, what it really changes is that it changes the speed and scale and cost that you can do things. You can do things that you couldn't conceive. I mean, we've, we, we've had surveillance, of course, in the past. Um, but you can do things at a scale that we've never had before. As, as an example, um, a couple of years ago, at a rock concert in China, the police were able to f pick out a wanted criminal, and they claimed it, this person they, they were, were, was a, a wanted felon, in a crowd of 60,000 people. That's not something that human eyes can do. You can't pick out a person in a crowd of 60,000 people. But that's something a computer can do. It changes the nature of, of what, you, what you can do. Um, and as an example, when the democracy protesters in Hong Kong uh, started to invade, for example, the airport, the first thing they did was they took down the cameras because the fact that, that those cameras could recognize them was their greatest threat to continue to be able to protest. 
And that, that does change the, the world we're in. Uh, um, and as I said, the scale that you can do it is, is amazing. Um, China has a system for, for scanning faces pretty much countrywide. It can scan a, a billion faces in a second. Um, in case you're, you have any doubts as to the intent of the system, it's called Skynet. Skynet, as you know, as you remember, is the AI computer in the Terminator series. Um, it, it, it really changes the world that you're in. Um, you know, previously, if, if, you, if you protested about something, you went out in a crowd, you went in a crowd of 1,000 people or 10,000 people, you were essentially anonymous. But now you're no longer anonymous. You can be identified and prosecuted or persecuted. Um, and all the things that, you know, all the rights that we've, we've demanded and, they've, and the way that we've changed the world is because people have gone out and protested and, um, and that changes the, the character of the world that we're in. And, and AI really puts that on steroids. So what are the sorts of other harms that um, might be committed? Well, I think, you know, one, one of the most significant harms is the increasing use of deep fakes. We can now use AI things like generative adversarial networks, to synthesize fake video, fake images, and fake audio. We've already seen a couple of examples of this. We're already seeing this being weaponized by um, people. If you, you might remember at the beginning of, of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, there was fake, deep fake video released right at the start, supposedly of the Ukrainian president calling upon his troops to surrender. It was a, a fake video. Um, there's been plentiful other fake video released to try and influence people. Um, and it's, it's an arms race. The, the video is getting uh, more realistic and easier to generate. There are now tools available. I mean, of course, like most of these things, um, it started out sadly to generate pornography, to, gener to put you know, celebrities' faces on the top of um, pornographic videos, um, but now the technology is being, for better or for worse, being democratized, and so that you can download apps that, that do this, to, can generate video. To begin with, you could see that these were fake videos. You could see there were artifacts, you could see um, that they weren't quite right. But like all these things, it's an arms race, as, 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 so people started developing tools to identify the fake videos. Um, and then they made um, the deep fake technology more sophisticated so that they defeated the tools, so they made the tools more sophisticated. It's a continual arms race, um, and you're always, as, as a defender, you're always playing catch up. Um, and it's got to the point now where it really is indistinguishable from the real thing. You can't tell um, these videos from the real thing. And that, that that changes lots of things. I mean, it means that we've got to be much more careful. Um, there's a prediction in the book about, about how I predict an election is going to be changed. Someone's going to release some compromising deep fake video, um, and it's going to be too late in the day for the, the person, uh, the politician in the video, to be able to counter uh, the impact that that has upon the voters. Um, and we have seen, you know, such deepfake video being released in elections around the world. Um, and that, where that's going to take us to. The, uh, it's not just video, of course, audio. It's very easy to synthesize um, audio that sounds like someone. You just need a little sample now of their voice and you can, and you can sound like someone. And that's being used... Um, in various ways that should be cause concern. Um, last year, there was a bank robbery uh, using some deep fake audio. They, they synthesized the voice um, of a company director who rang up his bank manager and said, we're acquiring another company for $34 million. Uh, my lawyer is going to be in touch and give you the coordinates to transfer the money. These were, this was, this was a, a bank robbery, a, a, a a virtual heist, if you like. Uh, and of course, the money quickly disappeared um, and they haven't been able to recover uh, most of the money. What's, what's amazing about the story, was, uh, which broke last year, 
was that this was not the first bank robbery that was done with deep fake. This was, in fact, at least the second that we know of bank robbery. There was another bank robbery um, in Europe um, where, again, deep fake was used, uh, deep fake audio was used to pretend to be someone authorizing a transfer, this time of just a quarter of a million dollars. Um, there may have been other bank robberies that, that we don't know about, um, but an example of how uh, the deep fake audio is being used to fool people, and of course, you know, people are always the weakest link. Um, so we're gonna have to be uh, much more careful about the provenance of things, I mean, careful about checking that it really, people are really who they say they are. There's lots of other harms that this will, will, will result in. Um, one of the harms is that it means that truth, our idea of what is true and what is false, what we can believe, what we shouldn't believe, becomes much more fuzzy. Uh, you know, it used, it used to be, if you caught a politician doing something on camera, they would have to own it. They would have to accept that that was you know, something they did and they would have to bear the consequences. That's no longer the case. Uh, there, for example, Trump was caught on camera saying some really offensive things about women um, and, he's, and he's denied it. He said, oh, that's deep fake. And he's got away with it. Um, uh, politicians will actually be held less accountable than they are today uh, because uh, our, our very nature of what truth is is going to be changed by the fact that we have these tools that can synthesize realistic audio, realistic video, realistic images that are indistinguishable from the real thing. And these ultimately could become, in the wrong hands, weapons of mass persuasion. So let me explain to you how you would build a weapon of mass persuasion. So there's um, so something else that you can synthesize now realistically is text that sounds like people. Uh, and indeed, they've done this. There's a number of, number of bots have been trained to sound like people. So, um, you know, one of the favorite ones, you can, you can have a look at what it looks like, is the Trump bot. Um, it's called Deep Drumpf. If anyone, have, anyone who watches uh, John Oliver knows that Drumpf is the old family name, German family name of the Trump family. And they've taken every one of his tweets and every one of his speeches and trained this bot to sound like Trump. Um, and it's actually pretty convincing. I mean, okay, it's Trump, so the bar is not particularly high. <laughs> but, but it does sound um, pretty similar to Trump. So it tweets, you can, you can read its tweets. It sounds pretty much similar to Trump. So that, that's one technology you can take. Another technology you can take is deepfake audio. We can just sample Trump speaking, and we can synthesize a voice that sounds like Trump. Now we can connect that to the Trump bot, so we can now um, put in the, the text, the speech of what Trump says, or um, a bot like Duplex that I mentioned at the start that can have a conversation with you um, and can have a conversation with you in the style of Trump. With the voice of Trump, now we can ring up every voter in the United States and have a personalized conversation with them and persuade them to vote for Trump. And it's, well, you will you will be fooled that it's Trump that has bothered to ring you up to actually ask for your vote. Um, that is technically possible today and not very expensive even to do and not very technically sophisticated to do. You could do that very much today. So that does take us to a strange, challenging, difficult world where people are gonna be ringing us up, pretending to be someone that they're not. In fact, they're not people ringing us up. It's a computer that is ringing us up. Um, and if we want to know where, where this is going to be perhaps uh, even worse, it's in the metaverse. Now, I'm not sure if the metaverse is, is ever going to take off, or at least uh, Mark Zuckerberg's vision of the metaverse. I'm not sure I want to log into Mark Zuckerberg's vision of the metaverse. But it's pretty likely that we are going to be living in much more virtual and augmented reality worlds. And most of the characters that you're going to meet in these augmented and virtual reality worlds are going to be synthetic. They're not going to be humans. They're going to be um, 
synthesized by computers. They're, maybe, they're, maybe they're going to be your avatar. Maybe there is a human behind them. But many of them aren't going to have even a human behind the avatar. They're going to be entirely synthetic as, as ways of engaging us in these virtual and augmented real worlds. So our very nature of reality, the, the, the people we interact, is going to, is, is going to change. It's going to be, most of the things that we're going to interact with are not going to be humans. They're going to be these computers. Uh, and that world, interestingly enough, um, is happening uh, today. Um, you, you might not realize, but there is already a chatbot that is used by one in 10 people on the internet. Half a billion people in China are using the Chios uh, uh, chatbot that was produced by Microsoft. They've now spun it out. It's a, it's a billion dollar company. Um, it's a chatbot. Um, it's a young female mostly, although you can, I believe now you can actually um, choose the character. You could choose the uh, the name and the, and, and, the, and the type of person it is, but it started out as a, a young female um, chatbot um, that people have very intimate conversations with. She receives, like Siri does, um, you know, constant round of marriage proposals um, and, again, um, pretends, like Duplex, to be a human, she pretends to have quirks of, of humans. Um, Microsoft, uh, interesting aside, Microsoft try to replicate the success of this chatbot in China um, in the West. And they produced a, a, a chatbot, uh, an 18-year-old uh, chatbot called Tay. Many of you will remember the story of Tay, which it took um, a few hours. Um, Tay was you know, an interesting AI chatbot. Uh, they left the machine learning on so it could learn from its interactions with people. Um, and Tay was very quickly taunted by people on the internet and turned into this racist, misogynist, Nazi-loving, um, vile uh, uh, person in, in very short order. Um, you know, fundamental, a couple of fundamental mistakes that, that uh, Microsoft made. One was that they didn't have a profanity filter on the input, so people trained it, taught it lots of uh, obscenity. Um, because that wasn't filtered on the input. There wasn't a profanity filter on the output. Um, so it then uh, reproduced lots of that obscenity that it was trained on. Um, and finally, and this is you know, a, a common mistake, um, a natural mistake in many respects, they left the machine learning on. They left the chatbot um, so that it could learn from its interactions. That's, that sounds like an a good idea, so it gets better over time. When it talks to people, it learns from those interactions. But of course, it learned um, some pretty vile things, um, and they didn't actually monitor it very closely, um, and it, it, um, you know, it evolved into something that um, was a you know, huge, great uh, controversy. So sadly, this is um, the world that we face, a world that we're gonna have to be um, more discriminatory um, you know, so what are, so I've mentioned lots of challenges. I shouldn't, I shouldn't leave you just with lots of challenges. I, sh I should talk about, um, you know, some of the, some of the remedies, how are we going to deal with some of these, these challenges? Uh, well, one, of course, is regulation. And actually, you're seeing that starting to happen today. Um, uh, the new EU AI Act includes uh, Article 31A on deep fakes, which requires... Um, platforms to label deep fakes as deep fakes, um, which uh, sounds to me like a pretty good idea indeed. Something I, po I, posed, I proposed back in 2015. I said we need to have red flags put up in front of um, things pretending to be human um, because we will be easily taken in. We, we are, you know, it's a human trait. You know, our, our, our superpower. Um, is our ability to, to interact socially. And we're very accommodating. You know, when, I, when you have a conversation with someone, you fill in the gaps, you, you fill in. We're, we're very accommodating. So even things that aren't quite right, computers that are not quite right, we're going to you know, accommodate in our, in our interactions. Um, so we will need more regulation. That's starting to, starting to, hear, uh, starting to appear. We'll need technologies. So as I said, uh, there's an arms race um, to recognize these sorts of technologies 
Um, unfortunately, that's, you're never going to win. As, as soon as you get uh, anyone who knows actually how a generative adversarial network works, it is itself an arms race. It's an arms race between uh, something that the classifier, that something tries to recognize, is this fake or is this real? And the generator, something that tries to generate something that's more real and less likely to be discovered as fake. So if you can, if you can Im improve the classifier, improve the thing that spots the fakes, then you actually also improve, inherently improve, uh, this, this to and fro, this, uh, this antagonism between uh, that you find in a generative adversarial network. So we're never going to win the technology arms race. There are always, as soon as you get better at recognizing things, the, the, the people generating these things are gonna make them, using those very same tools, are gonna make them better. Um, and then the final thing we need is we need education. At the end of the day, you know, most uh, cyber attacks rely upon the weak link, humans. They rely upon us clicking on the wrong link. They rely on us being fooled by one of these deep fakes. And so we, the users, have to be better educated that just because it says it's Trump, it isn't Trump, um, that there are increasingly sophisticated ways of fooling us um, that we will have to be aware of. Um, so as I said, if you want to know more, I would strongly encourage you. Um, I can only, I've only barely scratched the surface this morning. What are we doing on time? Yeah. Um, and uh, if you want to do no more, I would encourage you to take a look at my book. And now if we've got time, I'm happy to answer some questions. So if anyone has a question for Toby, raise your hand and we'll come up. G'day. Um, I was just wondering about maybe the economic impact. We're in the art gallery at the moment and there's some recent stuff that's come out with stable diffusion and being able to generate artwork. But just wondering on your focus on more of the economic imp uh, impact on people's livelihood and that leading to kind of Luddites and or maybe popularism where people would sort of capitalise on economic disruption. definitely need to be having this sort of conversation um, about the impact um, and as you see tools like Dali and Stable Diffusion they can do some pretty remarkable things and people who probably felt a year ago that their jobs were pretty safe graphic designers and the like uh, undoubtedly are feeling a, a little more concerned um, it's creating of course you know immense wealth those you know Stable Diffusion has just raised um, a couple of hundred million dollars have been valued as a, a unicorn at over a billion dollars. But equally, um, what's going to happen to those people whose jobs were um, graphic designers? Now, all of us can become graphic designers, right? So there is, um, you know, all of us can now do things that previously, but um, I don't think we're going to ever replace artists because um, it's not just about the technical ability to generate things that look good, it's about the, the meaning and the messages behind that. A computer is never going to fall in love and lose a loved one. Or speak to us about human uh, concerns because they're not human. Um, so artists, I think, are pretty safe. But there are lots of people whose jobs are going to be disrupted. That's always happened. Technology has always taken jobs away. Uh, in the past, technology has also always created far more jobs. I mean, if you look at the, group, the broad trend of history, since the beginning of the Astra Revolution, um, we have created lots of jobs because the world's population has increased dramatically, and unemployment, unemployment rates um, are at historical, broadly, at roughly speaking, are at historical low levels. So we've created millions of new jobs to fill in for the, the, the jobs that got automated in factories and elsewhere. That's no guarantee that that will continue. There is absolutely no guarantee that will continue. Um, and we may have to consider you know, some pretty radical solutions. Uh, and that's you know, one of the 
you know, there was a lot of pain in the last couple of years through the course of the pandemic. But I think one of the gifts of the pandemic was it allowed us to realize that we could reimagine society in quite different ways. We could pay people to stay home. We paid people to stay home for their own safety. Um, and the economy didn't go broke. Indeed, the economy seems to have survived quite reasonably. Um, there are interesting experiments going on uh, here in Australia, in New Zealand, in Europe, um, some very large experiments looking at what happens if you give people another day off. Instead of working five days a week, you work four days a week. Uh, and discovering, uh, you know, people forget the weekend, invention of the Industrial Revolution. There's nothing about the Earth going round the sun that requires you to have two days off every seven. It's a human-made construction gifted to us because of the benefits of technology. When we started to industrialize work, the workers, beginning in the northeast of England, stood up and said, we want to share some of that. We want to get Sunday off to go to church. And they you know, protested and unionized and got that. Then Saturday afternoon, then all of Saturday. And then for some strange reason, we stopped. We thought, I don't know why, but for the last 50 years, we thought, that's enough. That's all we need off. Um, despite the fact we've always had continual growths in productivity, we stopped asking for more time off. Um, uh, but we could have more time off if we chose. And, and what's interesting about these experiments with um, a four-day week is they discovered two remarkable facts. The first remarkable fact is that people are just as productive in four days of work as they were in five. Right? You stop having bullshit meetings, you get down to what you need to do, so you can pay people as much. Um, and secondly, people are happier. Who would have imagined? You work less, you spend more time with your family, more time in your community, more time doing your hobbies, more time doing the things that are important to you. Um, you know, when you get to the, um, your retirement, you don't say, you know what? I should have spent more time in the office. I really should have. You, you, people don't say that. Uh, and the machines could give us those sorts of gifts, but it would require us to think quite radically about how we run society, how we, sp how we share the benefits, and we're not doing that today. We are not sharing the benefits. The, the billionaires are getting richer, and the rest of us are being left behind. And I think we're, we're approaching a moment of, of, you know, where we have to really consider seriously, like we did with the Industrial Revolution, about how do we build a better world. And we did think quite, you know, we did make some pretty radical changes. If people forget, we introduced unions to protect the rights of workers. We introduced labor laws to stop sending children down the, the mines and the pits. Um, we introduced the welfare state in most countries so that people were supported if they didn't have a job. We introduced universal education so people were educated for, the, for those new jobs. We made some pretty radical changes to the way we ran society, um, how people worked, how we shared the, the spoils of the economy around to ensure that we all had better lives and we all did start to lead better lives. People forget the uh, life expectancy here in Australia has nearly doubled. When you, back in, before the Industrial Revolution, people lived to their 40s. People live to their 80s now. We have increased the quality of our lives. We live like kings and queens. We have machines that wash our clothes, wa wash our dishes, do things that people used to have servants for. Um, and so I think, you know, if we're careful, if we're, if we're mindful, we can, we can have that future ourselves. But we have to have, you know, as your question asks, we have to have, you know, think carefully about how do we make sure that we don't throw graphic designers or, or whoever onto the scrap heap of unemployment. How do we make sure that everyone is lifted by the rising tide of, of the technology?